great. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for inviting OSI. I mean, I think um, as the, the world runs more and more on open source software, it's important that um, the, the guiding lights um, of the foundations work more and more together. So it's really great to be here representing um, OSI. Um, one other thing, um, we're in Canada and it is Thanksgiving in Canada. So happy Thanksgiving, um, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> lot, to be, lot to be thankful for. Okay, so um, before we get into to AI and these really actually fascinating and interesting questions, I think it is just helpful to, to step back and, and learn a bit where I'm coming from so that, that might color the perspectives a little bit. I've been an open source lawyer um, starting law, well, as a law student and then as a lawyer um, for about 15 years now. I started my career at the Software Freedom Law Center representing uh, nonprofit um, uh, developers of, of open source free and open source software, um, including the Apache Software Foundation and many others uh, at the time um, did, a, did work reviewing documents for discovery and things like that for Apache and a lot of other um, interesting things like litigating the GPL and, and that, kind of, um, that kind of work. Um, then about six years ago, uh, Microsoft uh, called and they said, hey, we're, we're looking to hire an open source lawyer. And, and this was six years ago. I said to myself, wait a minute, uh, Microsoft open source? Like, yeah, right. Like, you know, what, what tricks are you trying to pull now, Microsoft? But then, you know, I went out and I, and I realized that they were actually kind of serious about um, open source. And, and it's been a, a wild ride um, over the last six years. Um, the last, and the reason I'm here today, um, I've been on the board of the Open Source Initiative for the, for the last um, two years. So just to like step back and think about, you know, where we are as we, we get into um, AI. It, open Source won. You know, if we look back over, you know, the 90s, 2000, 2010, you know, it, it's really wonderful to actually be able to say this. Open source is the basis of everything in the, in the technology industry. And uh, it's in most code bases, uh, over 90%. And the ones that it's not in is, is probably you know, some legacy code bases somewhere or another. And when you're starting a new uh, product, um, you look what open source projects you can use so that you can um, build and, and um, stand on the shoulders of others. In other words, Everybody has realized what we've been saying for, for years, which is the, um, <clears throat> the freedom to use, to modify, to share, to improve together the software makes great software and it's a great starting point um, for where we're going. And so what's interesting about AI is everybody's throwing around the term open source AI, but the default for a lot of the developers in that space was to throw the code or throw the models up on the internet and use the Apache license, use the MIT license, use the GPL, which doesn't make a lot of sense for some of the artifacts that they're throwing up there. But the, the scale of this is also amazing. Um, Hugging Face, which is a place people share these, um, uh, these models um, or you know, AI systems, uh, is doubling the number of available models every six months. When I started getting interested in this, some, some developer at Microsoft came to me and said, hey, like, I want to release some, some open source stuff. I'm like, great. They're like, I want to put it on Hugging Face. I was like, what's that? And I looked and there were 30,000 models. And I was like, uh-oh, like, I need to figure out the process for dealing with this really quickly. And now there's over, I checked this morning, over 350,000 models available. And like I said, doubling every six months. The scale is, is tremendous. So instead of starting in a place where you know, the default is proprietary, we're seeing that people are starting at a place where the default is open. And so then the question is kind of, what does that mean? And why did open source win is another you know, interesting question. And what, what the OSI kind of believe in what we've been stewarding is the idea that open source works because it removes barriers to sharing. That's what the open source definition, you know, really underpins it. And it's also what underpins the licenses. So I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so of course we're gonna have to look at, at a license. This is the proto MIT license from 1984. Okay, and um, I, like to, I like to put this license up just to, just to give people the ideas of what the lawyer was thinking 
back in 1984 when somebody said to them, hey, I want to be able to share this code. This code can be reproduced kind of everywhere and it's useful to so many people. How do I share it? And so the first thing that the, the lawyer said is I got to get copyright out of the way. So I got to give a broad grant because we get copyright by default now in software. I need to give a broad permission to it. And then I also need to make sure that if somebody uses this and puts it into their software, that uh, it doesn't hurt MIT. So we're going to disclaim, we're going to say, hey, it's as is, where is, and that's at the bottom. That's actually evolved a little bit in the current MIT license. It's a much longer disclaimer. It's all caps, which is uh, part of the, the uniform commercial code. It says you need to make it stand out a little bit more. And um, it, the, the, the MIT license also says you need to provide this notice to any downstream recipients of the code so that they know that we're not liable. Right, that's, you know, a lot of people call these attribution clauses, hey, like, I want credit, it's, it's that, and it's also, I don't want to get sued um, um, for this. So what are the barriers of sharing? Let's get, get copyright out of the way. Let's allow people to modify, share, work together, and let's make sure that we're not um, liable. Okay, so, so we've won, great. Like, what, now so, uh, open source is in everything, now all of a sudden we have huge new challenges, right? And what we're seeing, I'm not going to go you know, too deep into security product liability, but we're seeing regulators saying, hey, wait a minute. There's this software that's in everything, and it might have a security problem. Shouldn't the developers who wrote that software be responsible for fixing that security problem? Even if they're open source, even if they're non-commercial? Oh, th th this code got into a product? Shouldn't the developers who made the open source project be responsible? Aren't they the ones who can solve the problem and make it make the um, make the code safer when we put it into the product? Or should it be the person who's actually deploying the software for both security and product liability? And so there's a lot of questions that are going around a lot uh, going around those those issues. And then artificial intelligence comes along and people don't know what to do. They say, oh my goodness, it's so it's so scary. Um, that you know, these machines are able to do things that, that look like humans. Um, Llama is not an open source model, but um, when Meta released Llama, um, we had a similar a similar who's 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 the right person to to worry about this? The deployer or the developer? So Meta developed this. They released it under uh, let's call it a quasi open source. I think this is a non commercial license, but they released it, and immediately the um, the Senate. Richard Blumenthal is a U.S. senator. Him and Josh Hawley, another U.S. senator, um, wrote a letter to Meta and said, what did you do to make sure that this wasn't going to hurt people before you released it? And, and, and Steph, the, the executive director of OSI, when he saw this, he said, oh my goodness, this reminds me of the cryptography days, you know, back in the early days of open source when it was like, oh my goodness, if you release this code, this math that can do things and it's ready to go and it's functional, like, what are the consequences for society if anyone can use it? We should lock it down to a privileged few. And so, and so that's kind of, that's one of the reasons why we're investigating, we're doing this deep dive at OSI to figure out not just what should the definition be, but what's the definition so that developers can share and we can all innovate and continue this, you know, great innovation cycle we're working on in a way that is, you know, safe and responsible for society. Um, and just on all of those issues that I just described, you know, one of the things that, that OSI has been trying to do is um, to, to speak or get the different components of the open source community speaking together um, and, you know, sharing resources and ideas um, to educate uh, senators and educate, uh, you know, people about the benefits of open source and why it's so important that we allow people um, to share. And so th this is a, the initiative that we're, we're working on. Okay, so that brings us to AI and, and what we've been doing. The last year and a half, we've been doing uh, deep dive AI at OSI. Steph uh, produced a podcast where he talked to different people of different um, walks, ethicists, uh, AI developers, lawyers, um, to try to understand um, and get a, get a grounding on, on what AI is, so then we can ask the question, um, what is the right definition of open source AI? And 
the starting point in the discussion, and we're, we're now, you know, about in about a month, we're going to publish the first kind of proto definition for comments. Um, but, but the conversation so far has been to step back and say, what are our values? What are we trying to protect um, in open source? And I, 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 for me, it kind of comes back to you know, the principles that we talked about at the beginning about why, why, why sharing is good, right? Sharing is good because if you have the underlying code, you have autonomy. You can understand how it works. You have transparency into that. And you can improve it, share it, and other people uh, can collaboratively uh, make it better. And so then the question for AI, AI is a bit of a different system. So what is the preferred form of making modifications to the work? That's a, the reason I put that in quotes, is that that is in the open source definition. That is in the Apache license. It's in the GPL. It's a way that we've historically, as a community, described the thing that you need to have the, the uh, to have the principles that we want, that autonomy, that transparency, and the ability to collaboratively improve. A challenge with AI systems, though, is that the preferred form of making modification of the work doesn't necessarily give you all of those things. And so where, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm not a technologist. So, but this is a, maybe a caricature of a, of a neural network. Um, I got this off uh, uh, Google's uh, excellent site. This is a deep neural network um, because there's more than one layer. Those two hidden layers make it deep. If there's one layer, it's not deep. Um, that's that's a, about about what I know. But as we've been, you know, talking to technologists and really trying to think about what would a definition entail, what are the things that you might want to license that um, underlie um, uh, open source AI? What are what is the preferred form of making modifications work? We've basically come up with four things. There's the model architecture, which you can kind of see is the shape. Of, of this network and you know adding layers and having layers that do different things or, or you know splitting off layers um, you know I'll, I'll have different um, utilities in the space as far as I can understand again not a technologist um, there's data which is used to uh, train the network and 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 change the way that the the inputs relate to the outputs Right, and, and there's training algorithms that you can run. That's the software at the bottom. Um, it trains, it tests to make sure that everything's working uh, right on the inputs and outputs. And then um, there's inference, which means to run the model without training it. And basically, I think of it as like reflexes. Um, and then there's kind of analysis of like, how, what, why is the software doing what it's doing? And then there are the parameters, which are, are weights. The weights are, uh, they're, they're little numbers. Um, that would be between the nodes, and those, uh, you know, determine how the the signals from the input layer propagate uh, to the output layer. The weights now, what's 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 interesting, or my, in my understanding, is the weights are actually, for a lot of technologists, the preferred form of making modifications to the work. A lot of the models on Hugging Face are just weights files with like a Python script to you know load it into PyTorch, and. Um, Based on those, you can then you know, further train or modify the way the network operates. The underlying architecture and the underlying software is implied by the understanding of this huge, um, this huge weights file. And so the thing that we've been struggling with at OSI is how do we go back to those principles of uh, you know, autonomy and transparency and collaborative improvement when you when a, you just have a huge pile of numbers and like how do you determine yeah you can improve it you can have that collaborative improvement but how do you understand what are the underlying biases that might be existing for example in the data and where things seem to be going right now is that the art as long as the architecture the weights and the software are available and are able to be shared right um, without restriction under an open source license like the Apache license um, there seems to be no, uh, what's the right word, no controversy. That, that, should, that should definitely be the case for those things. The data is where the problem is because the data has that transparency um, issue. I've been, I've been showing this slide for about a year. I think it's still uh, pretty, pretty strong. I actually don't have the underlying text to it. This is a, it's an image. <laughs> um, but this shows kind of the spectrum and the problem, right? 
is that like if we want to say there's a like you can think of like there's less transparency or more transparency and with more transparency you're cutting off what might be beneficial uses of open right so if you if there's no obligation if let's say open source let's say we say we, there's no obligation to say anything about the data right the pro is that hey like we get more open source models and that's really kind of how people are using the term today um, on, on Hugging Base. The weights are available under Apache, so you know, have at it. Um, the con is that we don't know what's in there, so the value of transparency has been severely con compromised. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if we say you need to be able to share the data under an open license, right? Like true, open data, o ODI, Open Data in in Initiative approved license. Um, then we've cut off so much of the data that's available and out there um, under, you know, that, that's just out there on the internet that people are training on right now. And we've, we've taken, we've gone from a place where, you know, open source is kind of leading to where open source is, you know, how do we scrape together the data to compete? And then, you know, you can say, okay, it needs to be public data, but then what about, um, what about like health, um, health data? Right? Do we want to have ML models that are open source that uh, are able to determine whether there's, uh, you know, skin cancer? You know, take a picture of skin cancer and, and do that. The, the, the models that are out there right now can, can perform pretty well compared to doctors. Do we want to, you know, accelerate that by using open source innovation? But then what about the underlying data? And there's privacy rights and, and that kind of thing. And then, and then in the middle is something kind of like, hey, this is how we collected the data. Here's the demographics of the people. We collected this data for the health, uh, for the um, skin cancer treatments. We collected that in Sweden. So you might not want to use it in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Like we need to understand the biases in the data. And so you can give that transparency or as much of the transparency as you possibly can if you cannot share the data for some reason, but it gives people an understanding of the um, underlying um, biases that might be present. And so that's kind of the spectrum of options. And there's an converse, active conversation going on right now about it. And there are trade-offs. And the question is, what is the right place to, to, to put those trade-offs? And, and maybe somebody can figure out a way that those constraints and trade-offs don't, don't actually exist. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you if you've, if you've figured that out. I haven't been able to. And I don't think um, our community has been able to um, much either. OK. Um, so that's the kind of current state of play and that's the, the current debate. And you know, I, I'd love to talk to people over coffee, over beer um, about that later. But let's, let's actually look a little bit more forward at kind of the big questions as open source AI becomes you know, more of a thing. The, the current state of play is that there's a lot of open washing going on. Um, not to name, name names, but you know, large, large companies um, uh, have been saying that, that things are open source when they're not. They're actually trying to you know, get it out there and let people optimize it and the people are doing great things with it. But all the economic upside is being kept by the you know, large companies that are releasing um, the models in these ways. And like, that's not where I think all of us want to be. Um, data is going to be a really interesting um, issue. Like right now, these things are trained on you know, public data. We've seen a lot of lawsuits. Copyright is coming uh, back into play. And the, the question is, if big tech companies start making deals or exclusive deals with certain uh, you know, copyright owners to train on data, then does that lock out the open community from the ability to work in a lot of these um, areas if we're not allowed to train on public data or you know, data more generally um, because of exclusive arrangements with large tech companies? I think that's a world we don't want to uh, be in either. Um, as uh, AI starts to get regulated, we've talked, we talked a little bit about kind of the distinction between development and deployment, right? Should there be an exception for AI developers or is this technology too dangerous or is it too dangerous only in some um, areas? And so then the question is, what's the right scope? And getting the definition right, I think, matters. We don't want, for example, a large tech company that you know, keeps all the economic upside to, to also be able to say, well, you can't regulate me um, on this because the, the model's open source. So we, what we want is we want 
something that's open source to accrue benefit to everybody. And then if we do that, maybe it should be exempt from some of the regulations for the development, not the deployment. Once it's put into service, I think we, we all agree that regulation should occur. Um, AI governance, open source AI governance. There are different parts of the system. What are the right you know, ways of building communities around this? We know how to build software. What's the best way to build an, an open data set to make sure that it's you know, safe, that it's, um, that like biases are removed, um, things like that. I don't, th these, are, these are, I think, really interesting questions um, that the open data community has been struggling with for years, but I think there's a new imperative here, which is that it used to be open data was just kind of like, well, we throw the data out there and we do a little bit of curation on it, but you know, how useful is that? Now, all of a sudden, when the data is used for training, there's an imperative to keep the data up to date to keep the data you know, free of bias and the data is, is useful. I mean, the most successful open data projects are maps because it's important for maps, map data to stay up to date because you know, so you get the up, back upstream contributions so you don't you know, drive off a cliff, right? Here with other parts of data, all of a sudden keeping the data up to date, making sure that the things that are in that data set are responsible and should be there and that it's free of bias, et cetera, is important. So you wanna stand up and keep that um, that data fresh and there's an imperative to kind of continue to work on it in a community way. And everybody wants to pull the latest and graces. And then the final kind of interesting economic question that I, that I have around this is, um, what is upstream gonna mean for open source AI systems? Open source, there's always been kind of like a practical imperative to get your code back upstream. So that the testing, the safety, like we can all share the burden of doing that for the kind of latest and greatest modifications. Um, so you don't need to maintain a patch set so that you know the next release you need to go and do all sorts of refactoring to make sure that you know your additions work with the new um, with the new version. What I'm seeing with AI or open source AI systems is that people will take it and say, okay, like now I'm gonna make it be better at you know, drawing pictures of Justin Colonino. Like this, is, this was a generative AI system and like we fine tuned it on pictures of Justin Colonino. Now we have one that does, does Justin really well, but it doesn't do other things really well. Um, and what we're gonna see is these kind of constellations, I think, appearing where like you have you know, large language models that are really good at talking to doctors, really good at talking to lawyers, but maybe there's not a coherent upstream for each one of those, you kind of have a constellation. And then the question is, what's the best way to work together and collaboratively improve um, in that area? Okay, big questions, few answers, um, but what can we do? <laughs> to try to answer some of those. Um, well, first is, is join, join the Open Source Initiative. Um, and there's a link to do that right there. Um, join our deep dive conversations. They're gonna be at, you know, coming to conferences near you. I think the next one's gonna be at All Things Open. The folks are gonna be there. Um, go, go say hi to Stefano um, and, and join the conversation. If you have ideas about what I've been talking about today, we wanna to hear from you. This is a, a, a tough nut to crack and an important one, I think. Um, the, the OPA, so if you're, you know, you're, I think Apache Hope will be joining the OPA with us if you're not already, um, but uh, if you're involved in other nonprofits, you know, make your voice heard, like let's get together. When we, when we speak with, when we speak together, we speak um, louder and uh, people, people are paying attention. And um, finally, um, donate to the OSI. Um, you know, we're, we're a small nonprofit. Um, and uh, we could use uh, more resources to tackle these, these challenging problems. And with that, um, I'll release you to coffee or release you to Rich. Thanks very much um, for your attention and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the hallway. Thanks so much.